Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Hosfield, and welcome to our Young Timers Community Stories. I believe that the most valuable and meaningful insight a person can receive when facing early onset familial Alzheimer's disease is insight from within our community. Jetska Vanderschar is someone from this community who continues to serve as an inspiration and voice for our community. Jetska is a PhD student at Amsterdam UMC, where she investigates medical ethical dilemmas in early stages of Alzheimer's disease. She regularly writes and speaks about hereditary dementia. She is also the author of Oi Vigilenta, which means Eternal Spring, a story about her life and struggle for hope. She is a major advocate for early onset familial Alzheimer's disease, even appearing on national television in the Netherlands to share her genetic status and breaking the stigma surrounding this disease. Jetske, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Jetske, you've been such a strong advocate for the early onset familial Alzheimer's disease community, also known as dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease community. Um, I think it was at the Diane conference in 2019, after telling you story, you got a standing ovation. And I remember looking around and seeing everyone nodding their heads, oftentimes with tears in their eyes and clapping. And I think so many just felt so seen and heard in that moment. And I think there's something so powerful that overcomes you when you hear somebody put into words things that you feel, but I think you don't really necessarily know how to express or even know that you know, that you have these feelings because they're buried so deep inside of you. And so to hear them so beautifully expressed from someone like you did, I mean, well, naturally you can understand why I wanted to interview you today. Mm -hmm. So um, before we begin, I just wanna thank you for coming here today and for having the strength and bravery to be a voice for so many um, in our community who can't speak. I think it's very important because my the story I told at this conference it was like a cry from the heart because I think when I was struggling with this um, I knew my grandfather when I was a, when I was a kid but he was already sick and when I was six seven years old and I well I knew he was my grandfather but I never knew who he was and he died very young when I was still a little girl and then afterward I grew up similar to I think everybody else in my neighborhood and Alzheimer's and dementia didn't really was wasn't really a topic in our family until my uh, uncle got sick and he was my mother's only brother and my mom she recognized the symptoms immediately and she had always known um, my grandfather's young illness uh, it, it was not normal and back then she had donated his brain for research but um, well, this is not so long ago, but back then we, we didn't know about genetic causes of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. But when her brother got sick with similar symptoms, um, she, she went looking for answers again. And it turned out it was uh, familial in our family and she had a 50-50 chance of inheriting this gene. And um, while well, she was struggling with, do I want to find out my status or do I not want to find out? And in the end, well, turned out she didn't have to find out because she also got ill and she was around 55 I think back then and when when all of this was happening it felt like we were the only family dealing with a, a parent who got sick at such a young age I didn't know any other family dealing with these these challenges and, and this struggle uh, let alone a family dealing with the uh, hered hereditary kind so it felt like we were the exception and I couldn't talk to anyone else about it. I didn't know of anyone else about it. And in the end, after years, I got in touch in, with a, some sort of support group uh, of children uh, from, from parents who had early onset dementia. And even there, there was no one um, with a familial cause, with a genetic cause. So even in this little group of exceptions, I was the exception. And it felt like we were invisible, unseen, we didn't matter, and it, it wasn't important. And my only reference was this character from uh, this television series called House, Dr. House, and there was this character called 13, and she was struggling with, uh, with Huntington's and whether she was carrying this gene or not. And that was my only reference. And we were scared to talk about this because 
we thought, well, if people know this runs in the family, um, will they want to hire us? Will they want to have relationships with us? Will they, you know, um, will they treat us differently as damaged goods or something? It felt like this giant, you know, this, this scarlet letter A or something like that. And then years later, when I um, visited uh, the clinical geneticist, you know, wondering whether I wanted to, to test and find out my own status I also asked well can we get in touch with anyone else who's dealing with this or with anyone who's been through this process what is it like to find out your status what's it like to live with it if I do have the gene or if I don't have the gene and then they told us well we can't tell you um, and we can't bring you in touch with anyone else due to privacy reasons and I think it's so isolating to to feel like you're the only one struggling with it and i thought well it must be it uh, must be my fault that i find it so so hard to deal with it and i must be there must be something wrong with it that i can't find <laughs> a better way to to live with this and and to go on with this and i think um all this loneliness and feeling awkward and not knowing how to relate to that it is not necessary and it's an unnecessary burden that we can take away because um, when you do meet other people dealing with the same challenges and the same troubles and the same struggles it doesn't change the disease but it does make you feel like okay I'm not the only one you're not alone anymore and that was the reason why I wanted to share my story, um, even though I was scared and I thought, okay, perhaps I share my story at this conference and they all say, well, now it's totally different for me. <laughs> um, but it was like a cry from my heart, you know, to, to, to find out if anyone else recognized this because I, it was my need to, to find similar souls and to share this and to find out how we can help each other to deal with this. So that's, um, well, I think that's my, my main motivation to, mm -hmm. to share my story and to keep on sharing it because even, even now when I, uh, when I give a lecture somewhere, there's always uh, after everything is finished and we're done, someone from the back approaches me when I'm on my way out and says, oh, can I ask you something? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with this too. And I don't know who else to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many more people uh, like okay. us out there who don't know where to find their answers and their help and their support. And I think uh, it's, uh, we, 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 can, we cannot cure the disease yet, but we can do something about this isolation. And um, I think that that's one of the things that drives me. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think so much of your story within this community, I mean, it resonates on so many levels, you know, going to a support group that's supposedly for dementia or Alzheimer's and being the youngest person there and, you know, never really finding like you have an equal who really gets it, you know? And so I, you know, having somebody on the stage like you, who's totally getting it, I mean, that's so powerful. And like you said, I mean, we can't cure the disease, but we can help people, you know, deal with what is happening now. What are they struggling with now? Um, so before I get into the questions, because I know a lot of people in our community are really interested in understanding how somebody gets to that point where they're ready to know their genetic status before they do that. Um, you know, a lot of big things have happened in your life and in your story um, that I want to mention. And first of all, you know, you, you told your story on the biggest stage, <laughs> which was on national TV. Um, so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that. And then, you know, you also have written a book um, which I would love to know when it's going to be published in English. <laughs> and I also know that, you know, you kind of shifted your career and you're actually now an Alzheimer's researcher. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit more about, you know, those really big things um, that are now a part of your story as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think the disease has changed a lot in my life and some things for worse and some other things uh, for better, I think. And um, 
at first when I when I found out my own genetic status and I carry the gene, which means I will probably be sim well, I, I will be symptomatic probably around the age of 55, just like my mom and my uncle and my grandfather. Uh, and at first I, I didn't tell anyone um, because if I told anyone and, and who I told was kind of the only control that I had left over this disease. So I thought I just want, I'm not ready to share it yet because then it's like out of my control. And I, well, that was all that was left. And also I didn't want to burden my family because my father was taking care of my mom and that was weighing hard on him. And my mom was still alive and she wouldn't understand, I think, but she would feel the emotion. And then I also have a brother and a sister and I didn't want my decision and my outcome to influence them. And I thought, well, it's not like I'm never going to tell them, but I'm I'm not going to tell them now because it was also, we thought our last Christmas with my mom um, around that time. So I didn't tell. And because I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell my friends. So I kind of didn't tell anyone. <laughs> um, but I got tested because I thought, well, if I know, uh, perhaps I can do something with this information. So I went on looking for information on the internet and I was trying to get in touch with uh, neurologists and professors. And uh, after a very long search, I found this professor at Alzheimer's Center Amsterdam. And he was like the first person in my life who said, oh, um, well, this is very interesting and I, I know a lot about this disease and he had all the answers that no one had ever been able to give me and then some wow. and he said well there's this Diane study and you can take part in it perhaps but um, we didn't have Diane in the Netherlands because we didn't think there were enough families to participate in uh, in Diane research so I tried to find, find out more about this study because I thought, well, if this is the only study I can participate in, because most uh, studies have um, a minimum age of 55 or even older, so I didn't qualify for anything else. Um, I thought, well, I have to get in this Diane study. Um, and then I found out this, there's this huge um, dilemma because for research people, like us are very valuable because they know we'll get sick they know when we'll get sick and it's perfect opportunity to study the course of the disease and to try if we can stop it before we become symptomatic uh, but on the other hand um, the families it concerns don't know about this research and um, I mean I had to try so hard to find out this information. So I, I thought there must be more people not knowing about this who are desperate to do something. So I was harassing everyone. I knew this professor in Amsterdam and then people at Diane, we have to be more vocal about this. We have to reach those people because I think the families are there and the research is there, but the, the researchers don't know where the families are. The families don't know about this research. So we have to break this. And then, um, well, this professor said after some time, he was invited for a Dutch television uh, live talk show, prime time. And he said, I'm gonna talk about familiar Alzheimer's disease and uh, are you willing to come with me? <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. How can I, how can I be on television and talk about this and say this runs in my family without answering the immediate question wh whether I carry this gene too, but then, um, I also knew somewhere deep down that I was going to do that because I knew my grandfather and my uncle and my mom, uh, they weren't able to, to um, be vocal about this and tell their story. And I thought, well, I, it would have been nice, <laughs> would have been great if someone else had done it. Um, but if, um, if I'm asked to do this now, well, then perhaps I should. Uh, and I was very, very scared, I thought. I only thought about everything that could go wrong and all that. I thought, well, nobody wants to hire me for work anymore. And my friends will find it awkward to be with me and all those things and all those negative consequences. And then uh, the one thing I hadn't considered was the enormous impact in a positive way that it had, because 
um, it, it was uh, many people had seen it and it had a massive impact and many families came forward and said we also have this in our family and we also want to join research and there were more than enough to start Diane in the Netherlands and wow. then also um, it kind of made the whole subject discussable so it it's easier to talk about it now and people have seen it on television and they have had the chance to, to think about it and then to approach this subject and well after all these years I have somehow learned to talk about this a little bit so it, it did change a lot and where I was very scared of you know stigma and isolation and the people would let me down the exact opposite happened and there was this massive outpouring of support um, a lasting support uh, for families like ours so that was um Oh, wow. the unexpected result but very very just powerful. getting goosebumps like listening to that you know? <laughs> it's really incredible just that you know you you were like all right I mean I'm I guess I mean it'd be great if somebody else did it but there is nobody else and I mean that takes so much strength and bravery so just thank you I don't know yeah. I think it's also a sort of desperation I didn't know what else to do I mean I didn't I didn't have any other uh, opportunity to to do something about this and by this time I had asked all these doctors and I have asked all these people and I searched everything online and I didn't know what else to do and this was my last resort so I thought okay I, I'd rather do things that I regret than not do things at all so Okay, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was, you know, you had all these letters and flowers and sent to you. And I mean, all of these, all of this community now, all of a sudden. So was that kind of the reason why you decided to maybe write the book? And then also, you know, what, you know, start, start research in Alzheimer's disease? I mean, what did that, how did that look? moving forward yeah well I, I'd written the book before and when my mom got sick I knew I wanted to write about this because I realized we were in this very unique position and something was happening to us and I knew it was different from what was happening to other people it was different from uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease and late onset disease which is not to say one is worse or better than the other but it's different mm -hmm. um and we ran into unique challenges and, and unique troubles sometimes. And I thought it was worthwhile to share this um, so other people would understand better what was happening to us and other people would recognize themselves in it perhaps or learn something from it perhaps because all those challenges that the disease throws at us, we also learn a lot from that. And, um, I think that's important to realize as well. So I just thought there's a story here and I think it's a story that needs to be told because um, I mean, when you're in research, a lot of times it's, it's about statistics and about numbers and tables and figures, but I really believe that a story can, can be much more powerful. And if people can, can identify with the person, um, it, it can have a, an enormous effect that numbers do not have because then it, when, once people realize I'm not so very different from you, I could have been you or I recognize something for myself in you. Um, I think that's when you start to connect and people feel like, okay, this, this is about all of us and it should matter to all of us. Um, and I, I, I believe that's a, a powerful way to to bring about change. So I thought I want to share it. And also because I, I thought I had something um, that I felt was worth telling. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think it's also a tribute to my mom and my father and the way we grew up and a way to, uh, to, to um, it's also a testament of who, who my parents were, but also who I am. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was important to to write that down. So um, yeah. Well, I hope it gets published in English soon, or I'm gonna have to learn. Yeah, Dutch. I'm not sure when <laughs> and if, <laughs> but you're not the only one asking about it. So I'll I'll check with my publisher. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, um, I think it's, I, I, again, I think this community always struggles with this big question of to test or not to test. So, um, so I'd like to kind of dive deeper into those questions if that, that's all right. Um, so listen to your story and you spoke about how your mom and you both had a question that you know, kind of haunted you to like this big and, and the whole community it's to test or not to test, to know whether you carry the mutation or not. Um, ultimately she decided not to get tested, but you decided to get tested and you went into a little bit of why, why you did that. Um, and again, I think a lot of people in this community struggle with this question. Some like your mom don't want to know, and they know they don't want to know. Um, and then others kind of you know, some know, and they're like, all right, I'm going to get tested. But I think there's a lot of people who are kind of caught in this in-between limbo area where one day they think, oh, I'm ready, you know, and then the next day they wake up and they're like, I, I can't, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, if maybe you could help maybe give some insight to those people who are struggling, you know, how did you know you were ready to find out your mutation status and having gone through it now, knowing what you know, you know, what would you tell others? What would you tell your younger self? Um, and, you know, especially people who are contemplating this very complicated and difficult decision, what advice, what advice you would give them? Well, I think that's, it's, it's difficult because um, ultimately it, it is, and it remains a very difficult decision. And I think also a very personal decision. So I, I want to um, stress that I, I don't give advice. I don't think you should do it. I don't think you shouldn't do it, um, but I do think it should be an informed and deliberate decision. And I think that's one of the struggles because you don't know what is on the other side of testing. And there's so little information available and so little experience of people who have gone through all of this. Um, so at first when, when this decision um, was on the table, uh, we had a very short conversation <laughs> saying, why in the world would you want to know if there is nothing you can do to stop this disease? Um, so immediately we, we, my, my mom and, and my brother and sister and my father also said, well, no, of course we don't want to know. Um, but then my mom got sick and, you know, Alzheimer's came into our life. And um, when I was looking at my mom, I was wondering, I have your blue eyes. What else did I get from you? And I know that doesn't influence my chances of having this gene but it it did influence me and I was wondering is this my own life that's playing before my eyes and you know at some point it felt like my life my future was this road that was splitting in two tracks and one was going towards happily ever after the way well anyone has a chance to, to have and the other way was this short and awful that and wrote that was um, well that was obviously the undesirable outcome and I found it very very difficult to deal with that because this you know this is, it's a 50 50 chance but it's very difficult to navigate your life that, like that because there are so many tiny moments in the day when you feel when this comes up I mean when you go to a concert and you have to decide, am I going to wear earplugs to protect my ears? I immediately thought, will I need my ears? <laughs> will I get old enough to, to get trouble from this? Or when you're thinking about starting a family or even at work, when, when you're in a meeting about pensions, I was wondering, will, will I need it? And it was in all those tiny moments in every day that the, the question was on the table. And at some point I realized that I was... Um, I, it was not 50-50 in my head and I was um, preparing myself for the worst and you know um, having in the back of my head that the, 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 the worst option how that could play out and somehow this balance shifted and I was uh, preparing more for the for the bad outcome than for the good and after 
well years and <laughs> many conversations with my uh, my partner as well at some point i realized uh, perhaps i have more to gain than to lose because if i don't have the gene i don't have to worry about it all of it will it's unnecessary because if i don't have it if i can't pass it on it's all gone and good uh, and if i do have it perhaps then i can focus my thoughts and my worries and my energy into to doing something about it and um i don't know when you're ready i don't know if if you're ever ready um but i do think it's not the question of uh whether you want to know or not know, know but when you want to know because in the end at some point you will find out and i think the better question is is to ask when um, do you want to know and for me it was this point in time that i realized i have more to gain than to lose and um if i do carry the gene i can try to to do something with that and even though i can't cure it yet i i can um, take decisions and shift my priorities and uh, try to do something with that and um, um, I, it was devastating to hear the news it, it was awful and it's like an open wound that is always that never heals and that is changing over time and and even now, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I know and what I feel about it because it changes. And, you know, the, the raw experience of those first days and years, they transition into something different. And now the pain is sometimes different and the worries are different. And I'm sure in a couple of years time, it will be different. Um, but I also think there's such a thing as post-traumatic growth and uh, we are much more resilient than we than we think we are and and we can find a way through all of this and as horrible and as awful as it is to know what lies ahead and however disastrous and devastating this knowledge is on bad days it also reminds me i mean it's it's the um death is what gives meaning to life and what makes it so valuable and sometimes i think the disease reminds us of that and reminds me uh, I have to enjoy it today because I don't know about tomorrow and no one knows about tomorrow and it's not to say oh look at this silver lining but I do think there's two sides to it and sometimes it helps me to make choices and prioritize and sometimes it's you know this is best to say I'm not gonna do this <laughs> if I don't have eternity I'm not gonna waste my time on that yeah. and I feel like I reach those decisions much, much faster now and that's not to say that I can't get worked up if someone didn't put the garbage out or stuff like that I mean those little things are always there and sometimes I get lost in it and a week a month has flown flown by and I feel like okay what did I do with my time but every now and then it does um, put me back with my feet on the ground and makes me also incredibly grateful for the life that I have and the time that I have and all the um, joy and love and wealth in many ways that I have in it and um, and I think that's the other side there's also this reminder and it puts a pressure on life to you know to live it and to make something of it and to, to make it worthwhile and to, to do the, to do the things that you want to do even if you're mm -hmm. too scared to do them because that's better than not doing it at all and um, yeah so um um, but there's many things that I didn't realize uh, before testing be because I thought the big question is do you want to know or don't you want to know? And that's what I tried to prepare for, uh, for uh, as, as good as I, I could do that. Um, but what I didn't realize is that's the other question, do you want others to know? Uh -huh. uh, because beforehand, I mean, one of the, the reasons it's so difficult to talk about this is once you say there's a familial disease in, in our family, the first thing that people say is, oh, okay, and do you have the gene? And, you know, before I got tested, I could, say honestly I don't know but after I had been tested uh, I, I still got this question and and sometimes even in the middle of the street or at a party or the most inappropriate places and and then I had this choice do I tell someone that 
something that is very, very, very personal um, to someone that's not so close to me, or do I lie to someone I know? And that's that's a horrible decision. And it took me some time, and after that, I realized the best strategy is to say, "Oh well, would you want to know?" And then the whole conversation diverges, and yeah, <laughs> that was that my way out. That is a strategy. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that was a lifesaver, but. I never realized beforehand how that would change. And also um, now that it's out in the open and well, pretty much everybody knows it. Uh, sometimes it's difficult still because when I meet someone new or um, I don't know whether they know and there's always this awkward moment where they say they know or where I think they know and they don't know or I have to tell them well at some point it comes up because mm -hmm. well, it's also the reason I made some big choices in my life so it's sometimes it's awkward and, and um, still and um, well that actually leads yeah. really well I think into my next question but I just want to say you just had a lot of really great tidbits um, of information for people, um, you know, especially like not if I'm ready or not ready, but when I'm ready, because like you said, at some point it's going to come out. Are you wanting to know a year before onset? Is, do you want to know 10 years before onset? You know, like um, I think that's such a good way to think about it is when, and also just you know, painting a picture of what it's like on the other side. And I think for people to know that it is a potential wound. And I just also how grateful you are of continuing to talk about this, even though it is open, you know, um, and I'm sure having these conversations are difficult and kind of poke at it. Um, but I, again, I think it's yeah. so helpful for people to hear about this. It's helpful for family and friends to hear about this, the ones who will be supporting people um, through this. Yeah. So all really good points, but I do want to touch on once people do find out this information, I have heard other people, and you said it yourself, it almost becomes like a burden and like a secret. And I think a lot of people struggle with who and when to tell and how to tell you know, I heard one person say it's like, you know, she knows and it's like she feels like like her friends and family don't know a big part of who she is. So that feels like a burden. And then there was another a person who said they know, but they don't want to hurt their family by telling them, you know, she did end up becoming positive and she didn't want to put that weight on her on her parent or her siblings. So it, it does like this information does become a little bit like a burden and I think telling at least some people can maybe help relieve some of that burden and so I, I just want to ask you for a while you didn't tell anyone your status you sensed that it would be a blow that would take your family down so you didn't tell any others you've said that once you know your static it becomes almost a burden keeping a secret and wanting to grant people space to live their life but you also want you have this wanting to confront the disease and have their support. So there can be a real struggle there. We've spoken before about how you told people about your status in person through, you know, emails on national television. Um, so I really feel like you're in a really good place to maybe give advice to others who are trying to figure out, okay, now I know this information. How do I tell friends and family? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to even be about maybe their status, but maybe just that it runs in their family or that their parent is sick. Again, it could be that they carry the mutation um, and what they should prepare themselves for when sharing this information with others. Yeah, I think that's also an incredibly difficult decision. And also because it's it doesn't, it's not just about me or you, um, because this is a familial thing. And one of the challenges of talking about this is you can't just tell something about, about yourself. It, it's always something about your family, about your brothers, about your sisters, about your nieces and nephews and your parents. And, and um, for me, that was also a, a, an important reason not to tell about it because I, I didn't feel it was my place to share something about my family and you know within families sentiments always differ 
There's always one who wants to talk about it and who wants to make it public. And there's always one who doesn't want it and who wants to keep it private. And those two things don't go together. You can't respect both. One, one has to yield. And I think also in this, I've, I've been on both sides because for, I think, near three year, about three years, I, I hardly told anyone. I didn't tell my family and I only told a few friends. Um, you know, to respect my family's wishes and to um, to keep this for myself. And also because I didn't, I didn't know how to tell. And on the one hand, it's this very, very, very intimate thing. And it always feels like you're telling something that's much too personal. I mean, this is in the range of the things that you don't talk about with other people. Um, and especially not with people you don't know. But on the other hand, it's something that defines me whether I want to or not. And it's something that defines my life. And it puts such an enormous stamp on everything I do. I, it also, when I didn't tell people, it felt like I was under this bell jar. And people saw me, saw me, but I felt like they don't really see me. They don't really know me. They don't really know what's going on in my mind and why I take the decisions I take and why I do the things that I do and they, they don't they don't know me and it's very hard to have um, deep and meaningful relationships with people if there's such a big part of your life they, they don't know about. Um, but it also took me, I think really took me three years to learn how to talk about this because it's so very, very sensitive. And, you know, I remember the first times I, I, I told my peers that my mom had early onset Alzheimer's disease and it's so there's this awkward pause and people don't know what to say they don't they don't say anything at all and never get back to the subject and sometimes I wonder did I did I actually tell this or was that just a dream or sometimes people make this inappropriate remarks and say oh yes Alzheimer's I know that my grandmother had Alzheimer's when she was 98 and you know and it's not the Very same different. thing <laughs> yes or some sometimes people point out the silver linings and you know or they want to solve it or they want to give advice and all these things and at first whenever someone said something that I felt wasn't right you know I I um that was it. I, I couldn't go on. And then I didn't say anything anymore. And it took me even longer to try another time and to try another time. And um, I, I, it's something that I've had to learn how to talk about this, you know, how to find the words, what words to use, how to say this, but also how to help other people deal with me and also to find it in me to understand that they didn't understand me. So um, after um, well, a lot of talking and a lot of writing. Um, I think um, I realize it's just it's it's difficult for me and it's awkward for me and it's just as difficult and awkward for the other person. And you know, however much you want it to be different, it's up to us to help other people to deal with us. So I've learned to say, okay, this is a sensitive subject, and you know, this is the way I want you to deal with with this. So. Um, I tell them what I want and what I don't want. So I always say, you can ask me anything. And if it's over the line, then I will tell you and I won't answer your questions. It's okay. You can approach this subject anytime. And I will say, if it's not a good time, that's my way of dealing with it. Um, and, you know, by now, I think I've had every possible reaction, <laughs> including people who deny the existence of such a gene or who say, well, um, it's not definite that you will get the disease or people who come and help you with cures um, uh, or uh, remedies and will say, oh, if you do this or if you do that, you can turn the gene off and everything will be right to people who say, um, um, well, don't worry, uh, if, if I go outside, I can run under the bus too. So, <laughs> you know, it's not a big deal. Um, so and it it takes empathy for me as well to realize it's their way of struggling with this and um, so, so there's two things you have to learn one how to talk about this and two how to 
uh, understand how difficult it is for the people around around me because I do think it's an interaction and the difficulty of talking was just as much my my difficulty as it was their difficulty and um, um, it's it's hard to learn that and the only way I think is to try to keep on trying and I, I do think it does get better and also you know, before when I thought of my future, I did, it was like this whole black forest and I was scared to go in there. And even if I tried, I could do like one step, two steps, and that was it. And then I was running back because I, I couldn't go any further. But, you know, the, um, if you try and if you keep trying, you can, you know, shift your toe a little bit forward every time. You can get a little bit further before you're too scared and, and run back. And I think with talking about it, it's, it's very similar. You just have to try and keep on trying. And uh, at some point it does get better. And, and it's the same for the pain. I think you, you can learn to deal with it and you can um, learn to navigate around the sharpest parts or the things that you don't want to touch. And every time you can get a little bit close, you can learn how to, how to deal with it and also how to help other people deal with this at least that's what it's like for me mm -hmm. yeah I think you know obviously there's you probably it's it's going to be come down to a personal decision when you when you think about the people in your life that that have empathy and maybe have had other difficulties in their life they might be more understanding of how hard this is and they might actually be a greater support than, you know, somebody who's maybe, I don't know, maybe in your family and is trying to not, you know, deny that it's existence. It might even be easier to talk about a friend who's maybe lost a parent, you know, that they, they understand this. So I think you're right, you know, stepping into this yeah. black forest is really difficult, but maybe over time, you know, maybe learning, okay, I need to bring a flashlight and I need to bring a compass and I, you know, yeah. I need to, develop these tools that make it yeah. easier to be in this space I think that's such great advice yeah and you'll be surprised what you find there because that's also a thing I didn't realize but because I was I I told my status um there's also this other reaction that people tell me things and you know sharing this very personal thing about myself also deepens my connections to other people even sometimes strangers or people that I hardly know there are so many beautiful conversations that I've started from this and so many beautiful connections that I have formed just because you know each other better. You know something fundamental about each other. And if I tell something about me, someone else will, will say something too. And that bonds and that gives, uh, I think it also makes very meaningful and deep relationships. So um, I think everything has two sides and also there's sometimes it's hard but sometimes it's also beautiful yeah I totally agree and I think also within our community just connecting with people I feel like you're just immediately best friends too you know yeah. it's like if you can't help it because this person shares such a deep you know you don't even have to talk about you know the pain because they have felt it and they just know know what it is like and it's just yeah it's really special um definitely goes beyond talking about the weather that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right um so my last my last question um you said that it can be, be strange and scary for everybody to know you know what your greatest weakness is and we've talked we've spoken about how there's a tendency um, and not in this this conversation, but in previous um, exchanges about how there's a tendency in media to paint the darkest picture and describe people with early onset communal Alzheimer's disease as helpless vic victims. And you've done some amazing things since learning about, you know, that this disease runs in your family. You've written a book, you've pursued a PhD, you've helped bring clinical trials to the Netherlands. Um, that to me is very far from a helpless victim, um, but you are actively confronting this disease on a regular basis and, and showing that open wound. And I think many people struggle with the feelings that get stirred up when staying on top of research or just talking about the disease. Um, I'd like to ask you, um, what do you want people to know about this disease that doesn't often get heard or said? Um, and then 
A second part to that is for those who want to get more involved like you, um, what advice would you give them about pursuing a deeper knowledge about this disease, getting more involved in research um, and, and doing that, but, but also realizing that they want to pursue happiness and not let the disease take over their whole life. Um, so what, what advice can you offer those who are trying to, again, develop the ways to best cope and live their best what life? Yeah, well, I think this grabs the most difficult question. I think what people don't know about, about Alzheimer's disease or dementia is that it it is difficult and it is hard. And all those black pictures, I think they are pictures of the disease. Um, but I do think uh, there's beauty in it as well. And some of the moments um, with my mom, some memories of my mom are when she was ill. And, you know, because everything was difficult, there are those small moments that, that were so, so valuable. And even when she was sick, she, she taught me, she taught me so much and, and also about the meaning of life and what is really important in life. And when, you know, she lost who she was and what she could do, um, I think somehow she moved towards the essence of life and, and our relationship. And it felt like all the clutter and unnecessary things were peeled away. And somehow um, what was left is, is what was left. And, and, you know, just human connection and touching each other and laughing together. And um, I think in a way the disease teaches us that about life as well. It's, it's not about what type of car you buy or if you wear the right clothes or if you say the right things. It's those very human essential moments, I think. And in addition, especially the familial kinds of Alzheimer's disease, it, you know, it throws a lot of challenges our way. But what we sometimes tend to forget is how much we learn from that and how resilient we become and how strong the disease makes us. And um how that teaches us to deal with other stuff as well so in in that way i think um despite all the hardship it also made me stronger and made me believe okay if i can overcome all of that and if i can live through that then surely i i can take on this little challenge today so it also gives us uh, strength and sometimes you know it feels like I know it, it sometimes feels like you're let in on a secret about life. You know, you know that it's finite and you know that you don't have forever and you know that later or the future is, is not a promise. Um, and well, what I said before, it makes you cherish what you have and enjoy what you have and sometimes think, well, just leave everything. I'm, I'm going to enjoy the feeding of the sun on my face today or even the rain sometimes I think like I can feel it now and I can you know I can live this and even that is special um, as to your other question to be honest I find I find it hard to answer that because I'm also struggling with how large or small I want this disease to be in my life and how, how to find the balance into I want to do something meaningful with this, uh, but I also want to, want it sometimes just to not be there. And I want to do, I you know, I want. I'm also just me, <laughs> like anyone else. And in a lot of situations, I'm oh yeah, that's Jetske with the Alzheimer's gene, or Jetske with, you know, she's she's the Alzheimer's research, or she's the Alzheimer's writer, or all those other Alzheimer's hats that I sometimes wear. And it's it's difficult, and the only thing I think I can say is you know, reach out to people around you to to researchers in your country or physicians or you know if you're into art perhaps art try to find a way to, to channel this energy because you can you know I've, I've found that you can transform um, sadness and, and difficulty into something more beautiful um, for me writing the book was about that to, to try to transform something that was painful and hard and you know turn that into a book that 
um, also has beauty in it and, and uh, you know, make it in a different shape that I can, can better deal with. And I think it's important to find, to find something that suits you, whether it's, you know, activism or art or just anything else. And also to check regularly with yourself whether the balance is still right and sometimes um, to say well it, it's been enough for today or for this month or for this year and um, um, and to shift that because I also think that's something that's changing and it's a delicate balance and um, well if anyone knows how to find it I'd love to hear <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I I totally agree I think you know, art has this really amazing ability to connect people on, on deeper issues like pain, you know, whether that's listening to a song or reading a book or looking at a painting. I mean, sometimes those feelings that are so complicated, they can't be expressed in other ways. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, and yeah, I think learning to set boundaries um, is also such great advice. I mean, not just even about this disease, but we talk about it in the mental health field when it comes to, to other things, you know, and, yeah. and all of, and managing all the different parts of who we are, whether that's a researcher and, you know, a wife and, you know, a friend, um, you know, how that all fits together. So, Jetska, um, thank you so, so much for agreeing to, to talk to us today. Um, it was really like such an amazing, amazing interview. And I really think this will be such an important resource um, for those in our community to, to again, just, just hear from somebody who's on the other side and who's doing all of these incredible things and, and who gets it, you know? It's just so sometimes so important to just hear about people who are out living their life and they get it and, and they're, they're, they're a voice and, and I just am so grateful for all that you're doing in this community. So, so thank you for the interview and thank you for all that you're doing. And yeah, I hope, I hope we can continue our work together on, um, on, yeah, making this a better, a better place for people to exist that have these early onset dementias, because I think there's a lot that we can do moving forward. I totally agree. And, um, uh, I just want to say thank you for doing this and, you know, for building this platform and uh, connecting people with each other and offering all those support sessions and doing all those interviews um, besides your <laughs> regular work. <laughs> it really is amazing. And uh, um, sometimes it takes the perspective from an outsider to see how valuable it is. So thank you for that, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs>